the parlor should be. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the commission, good afternoon. It's good to see you and the subcommittee apologizes for the long uh, period of time during which you have been delayed this afternoon. We appreciate your presence here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, do you have an opening statement? Yes, I do. If you would proceed, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. On March the 2nd, 1990, you requested our participation in a hearing on the commission's licensing proceedings generally and on the Seabrook nuclear power station in particular. From the context and timing of this hearing, it is clear that the principal focus is to be the Commission's decision-making process as applied to contested emergency planning issues at Seabrook. Any doubt in that regard is removed by your letter of March 7, 1990, to me, in which you state, in part, I believe that there are critical safety issues regarding the emergency evacuation plans at Seabrook, which must be addressed before operation of the plant begins. As you are aware, plant operation could start as early as March 15, 1990. Therefore, the hearing date is in accordance with your own schedule, which you outlined upon issuing a full power license for Seabrook on March 1, 1990, and I must respectfully insist that you attend the hearing." End quote. On March 1, 1990, the Commission issued two decisions on emergency planning at Seabrook, which I shall summarize shortly. The most important consideration for us today is that these decisions are not the Commission's final word in the adjudicatory proceeding. The issues discussed in that decision, especially off-site emergency planning issues, will come before us again in our judicial capacity after the Appeal Board's review and depending on the course of judicial review, could in theory come before us again after judicial review. Therefore, your formal request that we appear before you has potentially serious and adverse consequences for the parties to the Seabrook proceeding. The legal principle is stated in Pillsbury versus Federal Trade Commission. Close congressional probing of an agency's deliberative process when an adjudication is still in progress can constitute improper pressure on the agency and deprive the parties of their rights to due process of law. This same principle is reflected in Chapter 9 of the House of Representatives Ethics Manual. Accordingly, I must state for the record that we are appearing before you today only because you called us to do so. To protect the due process rights of the parties, we cannot today respond to questions about contested issues related to licensing of Seabrook. Virtually all facets of emergency planning for Seabrook are contested. And these contested emergency planning issues include some very fundamental questions about the role of emergency planning that have broad application. Accordingly, the only course that will assure protection of the party's due process rights is for us to decline to respond to emergency planning questions today. If you have some generic emergency planning questions, we could respond later in writing to the best of our ability. Of course, we can always, either today or later, respond to questions about resolution of uncontested issues. I will briefly describe our decisions of March the 1st. Our adjudicatory boards rendered major decisions on emergency planning issues in late 1988 and again in late 1989. And aspects of the emergency planning proceeding came before the Commission itself in late 1989. On March 1, 1990, the Commission issued two decisions regarding the Seabrook facility. These decisions have been previously provided to the Committee. The first, CLI 9002, addresses a question certified to it by the Atomic Safety and Licensing Appeal Board during the course of the adjudicatory proceeding. That question sought commission guidance on whether certain testimony offered by the Massachusetts Attorney General addressing the dose consequences from specific hypothetical reactor accidents would be legally admissible to show that the New Hampshire Emergency Plan fails to comply with emergency planning regulations. The Commission concluded that the testimony was not admissible 
because the NRC's emergency planning regulations provide that emergency plans are to be evaluated according to the planning standards developed by the NRC and FEMA and set forth in 10 CFR 50.47 Bravo. That evaluation and these regulations, which are directed toward reasonably assuring protective measures across a broad spectrum of reactor accidents, do not contemplate consideration of the dose consequences that might be calculated for specific accident scenarios. To quote from our decision, it is by applying the generic guidance of the Regulation 16 standards to the review of individual emergency plans, not by attempting to predict the effects of particular hypothetical accidents occurring under particular hypothetical conditions of weather, time of year, and time of day, that the NRC satisfies itself that the goal of achieving dose reductions is met. Therefore, the Commission found the Massachusetts Attorney General's testimony inadmissible. The second decision, CLI 9003, allows the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board's authorization in November 1989 of a full power license for Seabrook to become immediately effective and decides several pending motions to vacate the Licensing Board's license authorization and to stay that authorization. The context for this decision needs to be carefully understood. Quoting from the Commission's order, the NRC's rules provide one extra step in the oversight of licensing decisions, the immediate effectiveness review. To explain when an Atomic Safety and Licensing Board authorizes the issuance of a license, that decision, like that of a trial court, need not await the completion of all appeals to become effective. As with the courts, the Commission's adjudicatory procedures allow a party to file a motion for a stay of an adverse decision. Where the Commission's procedures differ from those of the courts is that regardless of whether a stay request is filed, the Commission also conducts an immediate effectiveness review under 10 CFR paragraph 2.764 to determine whether the licensing board's decision should be allowed to take effect. The immediate effectiveness review is largely informal, relying on the existing adjudicatory record and parties' written comments. And it is without prejudice to later adjudicatory resolution of issues still in controversy. As a rule, the effectiveness review examines the reasonableness of the licensing board's decision without reaching any formal and final decision that no further review and revision of the decision could ever be required. After examining the pertinent adjudicatory decisions, and after carefully considering the extensive comments filed by the parties, the Commission concluded that none of the emergency planning issues which remain for resolution have sufficient safety significance to warrant withholding of a full power operating license. The decision to permit the licensing board's authorization to become effective does not end the Seabrook adjudicatory proceeding any more than a federal judge's decision on a request for preliminary injunction necessarily ends the lawsuit. As I stated earlier, the operating license proceeding is still ongoing. There are many contested issues which remain for resolution before the licensing and appeal boards and which will ultimately come before the Commission for final decision. On March 7th, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the New England Coalition on Nuclear Pollution, and the Seacoast Anti-Pollution League filed an emergency motion in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit challenging the Commission's authorization of the Seabrook Full Power License and requesting that issuance of the license be stayed. We filed answers this past Monday. Thus, the Commission's actions are currently under review in a federal court. That concludes my prepared statement, Mr. Chairman.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, is recognized. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, the, uh, uh, thank you very much for appearing uh, this afternoon. The, uh, the Institute for Nuclear Operations, INPO, evaluates safety upon the request of individual utilities. No nuclear, no nuclear insurance company will issue a policy unless it has full access to a company's INPO evaluations. Yet the NRC is willing to issue an operating license without examining INPO evaluations. It seems the insurance industry is more interested in safety than the NRC. Chairman Carr, you're familiar with that organization called the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations, are you not? Yes, I'm familiar with INPO. I understand that it uh, helps utilities evaluate its safety procedures, emergency preparedness, training, et cetera, is that correct? Uh, it certainly helps uh, utilities evaluate their training, it helps utilities evalu evaluate their operating procedures, it helps them uh, when they ask for help. It also uh, inspects them whether they ask or not. Yes, that's correct. I understand. I don't know about your statement about, uh, I have no knowledge of your statement about the insurers uh, not insuring them without a, uh, an info finding. That's beyond my knowledge. Okay. Um, well, I understand that the NRC has a formal agreement with info to control what information may be shared between INPO and the NRC, is that correct? We have a memorandum of understanding with INPO. Okay, for example, I understand your agreement includes a preview, a pre-review mechanism so that no utility will receive a formal information notice. An information notice is a standard method for the NRC to inform licensees of something significant that uh, no utility shall receive a formal information notice from the NRC until the NRC has given INPO a chance to argue that it is unnecessary or that the NRC's analysis is inaccurate. Is that correct? Is that part of the MOU, sir? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Would you read me that paragraph? INPO, um, uh, prior to issuing to the industry an information notice or other completed and formally documented analysis on a specific event at a nuclear power plant. The NRC agrees to make reasonable efforts to review available INPO CN products to determine if the information notice or other analysis is needed, and if so, that it is technically accurate. Similarly, INPO agrees to make reasonable efforts to review available NRC information notices or other completed analysis to determine if an INPO C in product is needed, and if so, that it is technically accurate. Unless a compelling safety concern dictates otherwise, the party identifying technical inaccuracies, if any, will give the other party reasonable advance notification of the inaccuracies and seek resolution before form formally issuing the information to the industry. That's uh, accurate, that quote. Okay. Your, your, Fine, your characterization of it was inaccurate. It's, it's reasonable to me that there is no use in duplicating effort if they report an incident to the utilities, which has already been reported, and we have gotten a copy of that, and we agree it's uh, properly notifi notified to the industry. And on the other hand, if we've properly notified the industry, there's no use in both organizations doing the same bit of work, which is amounts to a notification of industry of other problems. Okay. Okay, then. Are you allowed to see INPO safety evaluations of Seabrook done at the request of New Hampshire Yankee? We are allowed to view INPO's evaluations at the plant or at INPO headquarters in Atlanta. We, we are allowed access to the report we do not receive those reports. Okay. Have you uh, reviewed those um, safety evaluations? I have not. Uh, have you requested that you be allowed to review those safety evaluations? I have not. Um, why 
have you not asked for the safety evaluations of INPO? I don't have any requirement to look at INPO safety evaluations. We have been told that absolutely every precaution has been taken to ensure that the Seabrook nuclear power plant, uh, in fact, can be licensed without uh, all of the uh, uh, emergency evacuation planning that other nuclear power plants in America are required to, in fact, implement. Are you telling us that you, in turn, in, as part of your attempts to ensure that every step has been taken, haven't even asked INPO? I haven't asked INPO. That was a question. Okay. Well, a spokesman for New Hampshire Yankee um, today has stated that the president of the company will not hand over those safety reports. To whom? To you. I don't believe that he made that statement. I'm afraid he did, sir. Does that concern you that the, the head of uh, I that a, a spokesman for New Hampshire Yankee would say that they would not hand over those safety reports to you? I don't know that he made that statement. Um, I, I, uh, uh, again, I, if you want, I can read that to you as well, sir. Uh, but uh, uh, Would you I, please I, read that quote? I would be more than willing to uh, read that quote to you. Um, it says that uh, um, Seabrook spokesman Ron Shear last night uh, said last night that uh, Brown, that is the head of uh, New Hampshire Yankee, uh, will not attend the hearing and the safety reports of the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations will not be handed over. To whom? To whom? To anybody. Okay. Uh, I didn't say that in the quote you just read. You said, well, not attend the hearing. Are you going to request them? I don't plan to request them, no, sir. I didn't I have access. Did. Well, the ac answer then is to nobody, because they know you're not going to request them. I because have access. You've had 12 years to request these reports. So clearly, they don't have to answer the question as to whether or not they're going to hand them over to you, because they know you're not going to ask for them. The question then came to us as to whether or not they would hand them over to the Legislative Committee of Oversight over the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and they gave us the same answer that they probably gave you informally. They didn't which give me an answer. No, in. they will not give it to you. They didn't give me an answer informally nor formally. I have not asked for those reports. I told you those reports are accessible to the NRC. And I, and, and I asked you, why don't you gain access to them? I have access to them. And I why don't you ask for them? I have chosen not to use it. And why, you, why do you choose not to ask for them, sir? I, ch I can go up there and read that report. Why I, don't you? Why don't, haven't you? I don't see any reason to. Why not? What do you tell these people who live in the, within the 10-mile radius that you don't have time? Have you ever been to the Seabrook plant? No, sir, have you? You've never been to the Seabrook plant? No, sir. No. So you have never been to the plant. You haven't taken the time to read these documents that have been evaluating the, the safety uh, 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 problems at this plant over uh, the last uh, decade. I didn't and say the problems weren't evaluated. I said I had not seen no, the No, I, I did not say they no. weren't evaluated. I said you did not read these INPO safety evaluations. The insurance. Uh, I don't need to read those, sir. Why not? Those reports can be evaluated by people who work for me. Have they? I, yes, they have been evaluated. They have, they have or have not? Have. They have been. We have access to those reports. So you're saying that NRC officials have evaluated the impo reports? Yes, I have. I'm saying that. You've seen that? I won't say that they have evaluated every report, but you realize that if there's anything in that import report that is of serious safety significance, the utility is required to bring that to our attention by law. I understand that, but we're dealing with the Seabrook you nuclear power plant that. now. And, and uh, as you well know, that the, there has been a patent of, of, uh, of cover-up and deception, which has characterized... I don't the, well know that, sir. Well, I, again, you, you, if I can refresh your memory, you, 
you're well aware of the cover-up of the drug and alcohol abuse in the, in, on site during the construction of the Seabrook nuclear power plant in terms of the, um, in terms of the uh, uh, voluntary disclosure by the utility and then the uh, disclosure that came from a, an independent congressional evaluation of the near uh, 500 drug and alcohol related uh, incidents that had occurred on that plant site over a six year period. That's deception. You have mischaracterized uh, your statement just then that there has been deception of the NRC by the utility. That w I, 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 I know that you find it difficult to believe that, the, uh, that there are those within the nuclear industry at any time that would try to deceive the Nuclear it's Regulatory Commission. But I trying to deceive the Nuclear Regulatory Commission by people in the industry is one of the most serious offenses they can commit. I understand that. Uh, and I don't believe you have any proof that they've deceived us. If you do, I wish you would surface it and give it to me. I already have surfaced it, as you well know, over many years to no avail. They were not required to report those drugs. Recently, we have closed that loophole. But at the time you were talking about, they were not required to report those violations of, of drugs as, that you reported. Okay. Uh, I understand that no... Uh, nuclear insurer is willing to issue an insurance policy to a nuclear utility unless the availability of these INPO reports is a condition of coverage. Yet the NRC is willing to issue a full power license without insisting on the review of all INPO reports. Um, and I think it would be very helpful to us, uh, Chairman Carr, if you could provide to us uh, later on this evening out of your office files our first thing in the morning uh, the review which you uh, contend your staff has already made of these records. And I we'll will be happy to provide to you the amount of review our staff has given those info documents in the, either in Atlanta or at the utility. Okay. So at this point, um, you have yourself not taken advantage of the opportunity of comparing what uh, the industry says and what this info documentation might say. So perhaps uh, at this point, maybe you let me. Uh, would you say that again? Uh, that at this point, you have not taken advantage personally, Chairman Carr, of the opportunity of comparing uh, the information which uh, the utility may have been presenting to you as contrasted with the information which INPO uh, had developed. And since you won't look I don't understand when you say the, uh, what the information the utility presented to me as versus something INPO has. What do you mean as by that? As opposed to the information which was given to INPO or the information which INPO developed independently of what the utility may have given to them in terms of what the insurance coverage for that plant should be. That's So at this point you don't have, in other words, at this point you don't have a basis for knowing whether you've been deceived or not. Yeah. And I, I would just recommend to you, given the, the historic nation, nature of this decision, uh, that you at least be able to say uh, to the American people, if not to yourself, that you have taken the time to read the information on a personal basis so that you can uh, rest. No, I don't plan to do that. I understand that. I, I'm, I'm very not, happy. I don't know. I, I don't expect at this point for there to you be a break in a 14-year pattern at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission on this plan. All I'm doing is, again, just trying to raise the absolute uh, uh, resistance Mr. which has Mark existed all along to legitimate requests by citizens groups, by members of Congress, uh, by uh, attorneys general um, to uh, have these questions properly weighed by the commission. I understand what, what's going on. We all do. Mr. Uh, Markey, may I uh, make a statement? Sure you may. You're aware that I have uh, some 110 plants out there and INPO makes inspections in all of them and they make quite a few and uh, you're aware that there's no way in the world the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has enough people to read every inspection report in every plant. Our entire process depends on the licensee doing his job correctly, reporting deficiencies to us, and they do it every day. So the process has to work that way. Uh, you're aware of that. I'm quite aware of it, but I'm also quite aware of the relatively light workload that the NRC has had in licensing new nuclear power plants over the last uh, two or three years. And 
as a result, it would seem to me that your ability to focus upon the one, uh, the one plant which is in contention uh, would uh, free up some of your spare time to uh, perhaps read all the documentation that has resulted in a case being sent to the if Federal, you'd like, Cir Federal Circuit Court of Appeals. I don't know how many of your plants are now pending uh, 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 before the uh, Circuit Court of Appeals at the federal level, um, but uh, if there are so many, if, 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 if you have matters of that import uh, across the entire nuclear industry, then I, I would probably, I would appreciate the difficulty which you have. But I'll as we happy. know, this is the end of the line. This is the end of the pipeline. These are the final few plants. And as a result, it would seem to me that uh, you should have taken advantage of the opportunity to do that. I'll be happy to send you a day's worth of my reading, sir, if you think I'm under-read. Well, I, I'm, I'm not saying that you're uh, under-read. I'm just saying that you're not reading the right stuff. And mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the distinction I would make. Does the NRC have copies of INPO documents on file at headquarters? No. No. Why don't you have them on file at headquarters? Because I don't need them, A. I have access to them where they are filed if I want to see them. And so that's the only reason I don't want them. Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman, uh, uh, I understand that uh, the safety defects identified by INPO won't be corrected uh, at Seabrook until 1991. Does your staff know that? I'll get you the answer to that, but I'm sure that if there are defects in the Seabrook plant that are planned to be corrected in 1991, that's with our approval. Okay, so you're familiar with this then? This I didn't matter. say that. It's with your Don't approval. Don't put words in my mouth, you Mr. You said it's Congress. with your approval. What did you no, approve? I did not say that. Okay, excuse me. Why don't you uh, repeat Can that somebody what you said? Record what I, whoever's taking the record. Oh, Mr. Chairman, if you would not mind just reiterating your response to Congressman Markey. Thank if you'll you. repeat the question, I'll re repeat the answer. Okay. I understand that safety defects identified by INPO won't be corrected at Seabrook until 1991. Does your staff know that? If there are defects at Seabrook that won't be corrected until 1991, I'm sure our staff is aware of them and has approved that. Okay. Do you know about it? Do I know what? Do you know about the safety deficiencies that INPO has requested? I have not seen that plant? INPO report. Okay. Fine. So why should you license the plant then, Mr. Chairman? Why should we believe there. that you've done the type of thorough job that the people of our country should expect a multi-million dollar nuclear regulatory agency to have performed before a thousand megawatt nuclear power plant without state or, or local approved emergency evacuation plans being in place should be licensed. I don't believe you would ever believe it, sir. I don't believe what? You said, why should you believe that, that we had properly licensed the Seabrook? I said, why should the American people, why should the people who live within the 10 mile radius? If you haven't read this, if you don't, if you're not familiar Because with the there are no f deficiencies at the current time in the Seabrook plant that would prevent that plant operating at full power. The uh, uh, time, okay. I thank the gentleman. Thank you. Expired. The gentlelady from Nevada is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, for, I, as much, for as much time as she needs. Thank you very much. Um, I just simply wanted to. Um, say for the record in my discussion with uh, Governor Dukakis um, talking about this hearing and whether it was appropriate or inappropriate and I just wanted to state that we were at that time my specific information was I was only talking about the specific issues in litigation not the generic rulemaking, rulemaking on issues generally related to nuclear power or nuclear waste and uh, just to the um, to the chairman, uh, Mr. Carr, I'd like to simply point out that you more or less said the same thing on page two when you're re referring to the Pillsbury versus the Federal Trade Commission. Close congressional probing of an agency's deliberative process when an adjudication is still in progress can constitute improper pressure on the agency and deprive the parties of their rights to due process of law. And this was the statement that I was trying to make and trying to point that out. And and uh, I think that um, 
We in Congress very often are maybe jumping the gun a little bit and being involved in some of these issues, but um, I appreciate all of you coming, and I have no real no questions. I just wanted to make that statement for the record, and I thank the chairman. I thank the gentlelady from the bottom for her patience. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, is recognized. I thank the uh, the chair um, once again. Um, let me uh, let me. Uh, just uh, briefly note, if, if it's of any import, any, just, I'll just give it to you as a piece of information that uh, uh, Ralph and Nader and uh, Robert Pollard will be uh, testifying immediately after this panel about the INPO documents. And uh, I hope that you're not too busy um, and you might be able to stay and to uh, listen to uh, some of the questions which uh, are being raised about the relevancy of those INPO uh, documents and the safety analysis, which they... Uh, I have their paper, sir. Excuse me? I have a paper from those two persons, which was uh, delivered. Have you read it? Uh, no, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, you're consistent, and we appreciate... I got it in the car on the way that. here. We appreciate that. Um, the, um, the, the, the issue that we're dealing with here is uh, um, the first cousin of the, of the um, emergency evacuation issue that uh, was heavily debated in our country in the early 1980s, which was the ability to evacuate citizens uh, in the event of an all-out nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union. And uh, FEMA then was, as you know, uh, designated to, um, uh, to in fact ensure that uh, people could be evacuated. And the summary statement was um, uttered by Mr. Uh, T.K. Jones, who was the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Emergency Preparedness, uh, who said in, in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in re response to a question which was posed to him, he said, well, everybody's going to get a shovel, and if they dig a, f a hole three feet deep, they'll be able uh, and to put a door over it and then shovel dirt back on top. Everyone's going to make it if there's enough shovels to go around. And um, that was pretty much the summary view that we uh, had of, of the survivability of nuclear war in this country. And that was the state of debate. Now, we've moved pretty far beyond that. They have in the Soviet Union as well, uh, post Chernobyl, uh, closing down the semi politans nuclear uh, testing center because of the, the complaints of the people who live in the surrounding areas. Um, I was explaining that at one point to the sixth grade of a grammar school in my class, and, uh, and one of the kids raised up their hands. And uh, they said, uh, who's going to stay behind? to shovel dirt on top of my door. And I said to myself, well, I guess when a sixth grader can understand the deficiencies in the emergency evacuation plan for nuclear war, that uh, it probably is pretty obvious to just about everyone else, except the federal government. My feeling is that the same is true here. I have my 1990 emergency plan information calendar uh, to be uh, mailed out to, uh, by the New Hampshire Office of Emergency Management so that the um, residents of New Hampshire will know what uh, they should do in the event of an accident. Make sure you don't go to your school to pick up your child uh, in the event of a nuclear accident. Uh, turn, off the, turn off the water and close the doors and the windows. And uh, the first thing you should do if you're in a nuclear accident is take this calendar with you, it says. Because uh, this, this could be the key to your survival. And I suppose that's just about all they're going to be left with as they're running down the street, because there won't have been any really effective nuclear preparedness which has been put in place. That's quite clear at this point. Um, have decisions of the Atomic Safety and Licensing Appeal Board ever been overruled by the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board? That borders enough on the issues that, that are under contention that I am not going to answer that, sir. That is a factual question. I don't think it goes to any 
uh, relevant substantive question that is now being heard by the court. Chairman Carr? No, I, I say it borders on emergency planning issues and I'm not going to answer it. Chairman Carr, are you refusing to answer the question? Repeat the question. Are you refusing to answer the question? I, I have to remember what the question was. <laughs> if Congressman Markey will repeat the question which we refusing to answer. Okay, <laughs> thank you. But we're not sure. Okay. <laughs> Congressman Markey, would you repeat the question thank to you, Chairman, Chairman Carr? I will be glad to. Have decisions of the Atomic Safety and Licensing Appeal Board ever been before been overruled by the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board? I am a short timer with only three years experience in the agency. Let me check with the general counsel. Thank you. No. They have not at any point. Um, if there is no uh, minimum evacuation time for a nuclear power plant, could the NRC license a plant for which the minimum estimated evacuation time is eight hours, that 12 one, hours? I will not answer. That has to do with emergency planning, and I am not going to answer that question. This is a generic question. I am not going to answer that question. Why is that? It has to do with emergency planning. It, it, I am not asking you a question about the Seabrook nuclear power plant. Does the question have to do with emergency planning? It does have to do with emergency then planning. Then I'm not going to answer it. It doesn't have to do with any relevant issue that is now being considered by I the... refer you to my statement and my letter to the chairman. Chairman Carr, are you refusing to answer the That's question? That's correct. On emergency planning, I will refuse to answer all questions. On what legal basis, Mr. The, Chairman, do you refuse to answer the subcommittee's the question? question? The le emergency planning is still under contention. If you need the legal basis, it's the bill's If you were to suspend, Mr. Chairman, for just one second, uh, I'm, is, not, I'm not a lawyer and we have a lawyer up here. And it is the Pillsbury Doctrine if they I, want the I, legal I, basis. I understand that. If you would not mind, Mr. Chairman, suspending one moment, I'll respond to you. Thank you very much. Chairman Carr, the uh, counsel to the United States House of Representatives has informed me that uh, in his judgment and in my judgment as chairman of the subcommittee, in fact, uh, the subcommittee does not necessarily concur with uh, your judgment or with your counsel's judgment, uh, but will defer uh, on the issue of whether or not you can be or should be required to order the question, uh, answer the question. In the meantime, uh, I would ask the two members of the Commission who have recused themselves from this matter and have not participated in the Seabrook matter uh, if they will respond to the question, since they have no direct and will have no direct involvement in the matter currently before the Commission. But that, they, sir, they well, that, might. Mr. Chairman, that question is directed to uh, Commissioner Curtis and Commissioner Remick. Commissioner Curtis? Mr. Chairman, in view of the fact that uh, I have abstained from participating in Commission decisions on contested issues that have arisen or might arise in the Seabrook proceeding currently pending before the NRC involving the adequacy of the emergency preparedness plan for the Seabrook facility. I do not think it would be appropriate to comment on the decisions that have been rendered by the Commission on matters where I have abstained. Commissioner Remick. I fully agree with the statement just made by Commissioner Curtis. I have disqualified myself on uh, any matters relating to the emergency planning for Seabrook, and I think it would be inappropriate for me to answer that question. Commission, this does not relate to the Seabrook emergency evacuation plan. It's a generic question, as Mr. Markey indicated. It's a general question. I would once ask you again to respond to the question since it does not deal with Seabrook. I think it's inappropriate for me to, to answer that question. Even though it doesn't deal with Seabrook at all? I think it does indirectly deal with Seabrook. Parliamentary inquiry, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, the it, gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Smith, is recognized for a parliamentary inquiry. It, uh, it appears that uh, the gentlemen uh, uh, have uh, good cause, uh, since the, uh, the matter is still before the courts, not to uh, 
uh, speak here. I don't think they're refusing uh, the committee on any other grounds other than the fact that I believe the chairman uh, Carr said that it was uh, evacuation the, times are a contested issue. It's uh, it's in the courts. I I would think that they would be within their rights not to not to speak uh, should they uh, do anything that would uh, upset the court uh, at this point. Careful, don't get too much detail here. We're talking politics here. I don't care. Any other questions? Chairman Carr, will you provide the subcommittee within 72 hours uh, a, a written uh, explanation of your legal justification for refusing to answer these questions? Happily. And the committee uh, will reconvene at that time uh, to make a judgment as to whether or not you can be or should be ordered to answer the question, the gentleman from uh, Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, is recognized. I thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, very much. In the uh, uh, decision which you did make, uh, I understand that it will be very difficult to have you, Mr. Chairman, answer any generic questions uh, uh, or specific questions uh, related to Seabrook and um, and. Uh, I'm going to just uh, accept the inevitable here and not uh, proceed uh, uh, down that path of having you invoke that right, regardless of whether or not I believe or the chairman of the committee believes that it's appropriate. It's clear to me that you don't want to answer and you don't want to read and you don't want to hear, you don't want to visit, and I understand all that. That's, that's all part of the pattern going back to 1972 with this plant when Melder and Thompson and all of his glory decided that he'd plant. I think you're violating the Pillsbury Doctrine now by browbeating me, sir. Uh, the um, the um, gentleman is uh, uh, unfortunately feeling uh, a little bit of, uh, let's say, you know, Anger might not be the correct word, but a little bit, I'm a little bit perturbed that you won't answer generic questions. There's no question about it. I'm not upset that you won't answer specific questions about Seabrook. I think that's perfectly within your right, and under no manner, shape, or form would I want uh, you to respond to questions that in any way could taint this case. Uh, I was uh, intending for you to answer generic questions, and if uh, you feel as though uh, my uh, uh, be, my being upset with you because you won't even answer generic issues uh, is a browbeating of you, then you have every right to feel that way, but it's not uh, related in any manner, shape, or form to the specific issues that are in contestation at the Federal Court of Appeals. Um, I'll just, con I'll, I'll conclude on this, Mr. Chairman, because I know that there's a, um, little likelihood that we will get to those issues. Um, here's my problem that I have. The standard which the NRC uses um, to, in fact, license a nuclear power plant um, should be consistent with the law that passed out of this committee requiring reasonable assurance uh, that uh, uh, there would be adequate emergency evacuation plans constructed around nuclear power plants in this country. Now, the NRC adopted a regulation with a checklist of 16 requirements, none of which require any estimate of the dose people might receive. Um, now, I have a problem with that as a standard. There's no question about it. I think it's the relevant question. The checklist in and of itself means nothing if it doesn't relate to the uh, actual a problem which is seeking to be addressed, which is the reduction of the exposure to uh, the uh, dose rem of the, for the uh, affected individual, man, woman, a child. The NRC's approach to emergency planning is like a doctor deciding whether a person is alive or dead by taking out a checklist. Does he have arms, legs, ears, two eyes, a mouth? But a heartbeat is not on the checklist. Following the NRC's logic, a dead man could be alive because we never reached the central question of whether or not, in fact, there is real protection for the people against radiation inside that 
uh, inside that uh, evacuation area. And finally, I, I'd say this, Mr. Chairman. In 1986, a mayonnaise truck overturned on the Long Island Expressway, tying up traffic for one half an hour longer than the NRC's estimate of how long it would take to evacuate the entire community surrounding Shoreham. The NRC, the NRC simply does not want to contemplate the potentially catastrophic, catastrophic effect of a flat tire when it comes to sites like Shoreham or Seabrook. And I guess at heart that's where we differ. And to the extent to which the impo reports are still available, uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the uh, state's attorney general of Massachusetts, the communities that live in the near vicinity uh, would still uh, like to ensure, be guaranteed that the chairman of the commission and the other commissioners have availed themselves of all information. Uh, I make that request to you, uh, that you make, your, you make it yourself available, that you take the time, that you do the reading, uh, and you give the assurances in all good faith that you've done that reading uh, that guarantees that you've, uh, that you've protected the public to the optimum extent possible. I thank the chair. The uh, gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Smith, whose patience the chair appreciates is recognized for whatever time he may consume. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a few uh, questions I'd like to ask, and these will be questions uh, of the panel. I, I really uh, I don't have any speeches. I, I'd like to see this thing go forward. Uh, approximately how many pages of documentation does the NRC have on uh, Seabrook, if you could answer that, uh, Mr. Chairman? Do you have any idea? Uh, Gary, is no, it I the, don't have any idea. Sir. Is it in the tons? or I mean, w w you have studied this. How many hours have you spent uh, trying to study this problem? Uh, well, I would say that... I mean, this isn't something that's just been done since last Saturday. We've been going on here for 17 years. Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, the general counsel passed me a piece of paper that says for the construction permit there were 60 days of hearings, over 12,000 pages of transcripts. For the operating license there were over 110 days of hearings and 28,000 pages of transcript. 60 days and 110 days? Uh, gosh, uh, you know, I mean, that's, that's a tremendous amount of study and they, they were well attended, right? They weren't... Uh, they weren't just uh, done in the back room. Well, those hearings were done by our board, sir. Yes, sir. Well, you know, I, I think it's very frustrating for those of us that believe in safe nuclear energy who would like to see this opportunity to try and uh, reduce some of the pollution problems that we have and to try and save some of the fossil fuel. And I just uh, would uh, say that uh, you're a very patient group of uh, fellows there. I don't know how you... Uh, get by uh, the patients to uh, put up with some of the problems that we hand to you. Uh, you you've been given uh, a law to try and uh, guide your way through these hoops and uh, the people uh, at Sea uh, Brook or uh, Shoreham or any other of the uh, facilities have had to go through all the hoops uh, to arrive where they have a, a license. This one, I guess, uh, uh, if, unless there's been a stay issued, would probably be uh, ready to uh, operate soon, is that uh, hopefully? I just, uh, you know, you get frustrated in this uh, job uh, trying to, to be sure that uh, you get a, a fair hearing too. And um, so uh, I think that uh, 170 days of uh, hearings is a, a good number and 17 years in the process. How long has the facility been built? Uh, you know that? Uh, they uh, they were ready to operate in '86, is what I've been told. In 1986. Yeah. The well. uh, since the first of March, we have had one, two, three, five, seven letters from the Congress to answer with numerous questions and multiple questions, and so we've been putting in some time trying to get answers for all those. Well, I think uh, I probably uh, don't have any uh, further questions uh, of you. I, uh, I see, uh, I'll pass it back to the chairman, but I think that uh, you've been very patient today, indeed. The gentlelady from the state of Nevada. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no further questions. Chairman Carr, on February 27th, Senator Kennedy sent you questions concerning weld radiographs at Seabrook. You kindly provided us a copy of your response to the senator's inquiry. Included in the response was a February 28th memorandum from Mr. Russell to Mr. Taylor. 
This memorandum addressed the question of the rate at which a radiograph reviewer might find defects. The memorandum stated, and I quote, our assessment is that a 20% reject rate of radiographs during the first review by a level three examiner is not unusual. Can you tell me which are the nuclear reactor projects in the country where the first review by a level three examiner resulted in a 20% rejection rate? Uh, we'll, we'll try to provide that for the record. Uh, at the, uh, it certainly wasn't, uh, at that period of time in Seabrook, it wasn't unusual since it had ranged anywhere up to 38% or something rejection. They were having trouble getting good welders. And, uh, you said so the rejection rate sometimes went as high as 38%. I think that's the best of my re recollection. Was this applicable to uh, Seabrook exclusively, or are you speaking generally about well, the... Well, generally there were welding problems in the country, building plants at those times. I think we had some other problems around the country plants, but we'll try to get the answer for you for your question. Are you able to say whether or not the rate of rejection across the country equaled uh, the rate of rejection at Seabrook, Seabrook, which at its high was 38%, you've said? Uh, I think that uh, in some plants across the country it was comparable to Seabrook. Would you say that Seabrook was higher than other plants across the country? I don't know that. I'll have to find that out. Uh, Mr. Joseph Wampler was employed at the Seabrook site as a senior radiograph reviewer from August 83 to January 84. In early January 84 he was fired. Mr. Wampler subsequently claimed that he had been rejecting radiographs at the rate of 20%. My questions, do you know the percentage of the radiographs reviewed by Mr. Wampler that were, were rejected by him? Um, no, I don't know that. I don't know how many he rejected. Uh, do you know how many non-conformance reports and CRs were prepared by Mr. Wampler during his tenure as a Pullman Higgins employee from August 83 through January 84? Yeah, our latest check shows that he submitted three nonconformance reports. Three. Uh, what NRC inspection report addresses the problems found by Mr. Wampler, which you've just uh, described in the well, three? There are a number of those. Uh, we have uh, finished replying to Senator Kennedy's questions, and, and I didn't have a chance to get that through the rest of the commission and signed back over here. But those questions were adequately answered, and we'll get that over to you. Does Senator Kennedy have those answers? Not yet. I haven't signed them out yet. I understand. It's my understanding, Mr. Chairman, that when Mr. Wampler was fired, he went to the NRC inspector and said there are 16 uh, NCRs. Uh, do, do you know what has happened to those 16? Uh, he said there were about 16. Uh, I don't know that we have a list of those. If that was the list that Senator Kennedy put in the back of his letter, it turned out to be 15. And the documentation for those 15. I think we, that's a different, I think it's a different list. Mr. Wampler provided the NRC with what he said were his 16 at the time of his dismissal, which was in January of 1984. And I'm asking for the disposition of those 16. Uh, and the indication was he provided us a list of those 16 at that time? He said there were, he said there were 16 non-conforming reports. It's uh -huh. those 16 that I'm concerned about. I'll get about. you that answer. I appreciate it. Uh, you, have, you have provided us documents that indicate at the time Mr. Wampler was fired, he was in the process of completing these nonconformance reports. After he was fired, Mr. Wampler was informed, uh, did inform the NRC of these unfinished reports, which is what I've just said. On January 12th of 84, the NRC staff informed Mr. Wampler that his 16 NCRs, nonconforming reports, would be reviewed during a routine inspection. I gather you don't know whether that has yet been completed or not. Uh, I, I don't think that we informed him that we would check those 16 per se, but uh, it was uh, the information that we gave him was to the effect that we would follow up recognizing that he had 16 outstanding ones to make sure there was a process in place to take care of them. But we'll also provide that one for the record. This is covered in the in the letter that we need to get signed out back to Senator Kennedy. And we'll, Do you have a copy? We'll provide of, you a copy of that. Appreciate that. Do you have a copy of the letter you sent to Mr. Wampler in which you explained what you just explained to me? I don't believe there was a letter. I think it was a. Uh, uh, but we'll provide you the documentation of what we have there. I think it's probably documentation of the inspector who talked to Mr. Wampler. Well, I have a copy of the letter which was written on January 12th of 1984 to Mr. Wampler by Robert Gallo, NRC Region 1, mm -hmm. in which he said, and I quote one paragraph, your additional concern 
regarding the completion of approximately 16 nonconformance reports that were in preparation at the time of your termination will be reviewed by this office during a routine NRC Region 1 inspection at the Seabrook site. Right. We appreciate, and the, we appreciate your bringing these matters to our attention. And the concern was that there would be some follow-up. And uh, that concern was taken care of, and we'll provide that. Can you tell me, if you know, sir, what follow-up was taken? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, I read that, but I hate to re depend on my memory uh, to give you an answer right now. I understand. But, Mr. Russell did write a memo on February 28th indicating that the deficiencies which we've discussed have been corrected, and I'm wondering uh, what is the basis of that. We'll provide you that documentation. Mr. Russell's February 28, 1990 memorandum leaves the impression that NRC staff have confidence that Mr. Wampler's findings regarding radiographs and or welds, W-E-L-D-S, had been recognized and the deficiencies implicit therein corrected. This confidence, we infer, was derived from a series of inspections, yet the various inspection reports provided us to date, I have a list of them here, I won't read them, as far as we can tell, don't recognize that problems of the magnitude described by Wampler occurred nor do these reports contain sufficient documentation to enable an independent reviewer to determine the qualitative and quantitative nature of deficiencies in activities carried out by the contractor responsible for a significant portion of the safety-related welding at Seabrook. And I would ask, what then is the basis for NRC management in making the finding that the safety-related welding activities at Seabrook were conducted in accordance with the Commission's regulations, if we'll, that indeed is your view. We'll provide you that. Uh, that's, uh, we followed up on that. You're absolutely right. You couldn't track it from the data we gave you. We'll give you the data that you can track it from. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, when would you be back to me on that? Uh, uh, if, pro approximately. If, if I hadn't been here, I would have gotten it signed out this afternoon. We, we, we did, I understand that you're busy. We did get you uh, these questions two weeks ago, so if we could get them promptly, I'd appreciate it. Uh, I, have, uh, I have no further questions. Uh, Mr. Smith, Ms. Vukanovic, no, Mr. Markey, have you any further questions? Chairman Carr, we appreciate your attendance. I would remind you that you've uh, committed to me to respond within 72 hours in writing uh, as to the legal explanation for a refusal to answer those questions which Congressman Markey has put to you. It was uh, one question from, Chair, from Mr. Markey. Right? Yes, Correct. one question from Mr. Markey. Also, as to why the other commissioners who had recused themselves from the Seabrook matter also refused to respond to Congressman Markey's question. Yes, uh, sir. Thank you very Thank much, you Mr. Very Mr. Much. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioners, very much. I want to yield the chair to the gentleman from Massachusetts. I'll call the next panel, which is the last panel, Mr. Robert Pollard, Senior Nuclear Safety. Oh, it's not the last panel. It's not even close to the last panel. It's panel number five of eight. Mr. Robert Pollard, Senior Nuclear Safety Engineer, Union of Concerned Scientists, Mr. Ralph Nader. Gentlemen, welcome, and uh, we would ask the, uh, the uh, people who are by the doors down there if they could please close them so that uh, we could have quiet in the hearing room. And uh, what I'd like to do is to, uh, once again, um, introduce uh, Mr. Robert Pollard, who is a senior nuclear safety engineer for the Union of Concerned Scientists, and Mr. Ralph Nader. A consumer advocate. Uh, let us begin with you, Mr. Nader. Welcome to the subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 